Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Samuel! Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 141. Last week we saw where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had finished preparing Jesus' body. And it said in the text that the next day the chief priests and the Pharisees came before Pilate uh, kind of in a tizzy, a frantic state, paranoia. They were thinking that Jesus' body was going to be messed with, stolen to allude to his words earlier in his life concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, and they wanted extra fortifications around his tomb. So they yeah. Pilate had guards to be stationed next to the sealed tomb uh, to ensure that nothing fishy was going to happen. Right. Um, but we see later in the text that none of them probably expected what was actually going to happen, <laughs> and we see that yeah. through the witnesses of the two Marys and Salome as they go the day after Sabbath to bring more spices to prepare the body and relieve of the odor and stench and they get (laughs) to the tomb and the tomb has been rolled away and those soldiers are the text almost says like paralyzed, stricken with fear. We don't really know whether they're conscious or unconscious but then (laughs) the text says that there is an angel sitting on top of the tomb and he says this Jesus that you're looking for he's not here he's risen and Woo-hoo. just as he just as he said that he was going to do and then he says that he's going before you to Galilee and he wants you and his disciples and Peter to meet him there yeah. um and that's kind of where we left off from from last week so we we had some of the lowest moments of our time in the gospels and now we are back on the highest points death has been seemingly has been defeated through their account that jesus is now not in the tomb right yeah yeah we know that it has but for them it's all new and yeah right now you also smoothed a little bit because the eyewitness accounts i mean there's pretty big differences you talked about the matthew version where the angel's sitting on the stone and uh, the other versions we're going to see angels are inside the tomb and it's it's a mess but mm-hmm. we're just going to go with it let's go ahead and pick up where we left off this is Matthew chapter 28 verses 8 through 10 and Mark chapter 16 verse 8 and you know I think I'm going to have to read both just so we can kind of get the picture Matthew says this so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. All right, that was... I mean, kind of like what you already talked about, except Mm -hmm. it was the angel that was talking. Now we get to Mark, and he writes this. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Okay, that's two very (laughs) different responses. And of course, we're not even sure they're the same people or whatever this is again it's the eyewitness testimony it's different and weird so let's start let's talk about mark first samuel he describes you know kind of what the women are going through and it's it's very similar to what we imagined earlier when we were talking about angels and you know just the whole situation it was all kind of scary whatever trembling and astonishment had seized these women And he says that they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, Samuel, 
We do have two choices here. We could say, yeah, I mean, Mark wrote it. It's literal. It's, I mean, literally, they were so scared. They left and they told no one, period. Or we could take it as, listen, they were kind of given instructions. They were supposed to go tell someone something. And so they went away afraid and they didn't tell anyone along the way. But, you know, they did actually go where they were supposed to go and tell the guys what they were supposed to tell them. Right. You could look at that either way. It's not worth arguing, but I'm personally I'm going to go with. Listen, they were scared, afraid. They didn't see or talk to anyone all along the way. They went straight to the disciples so that they could tell them what they were supposed to tell them. But who knows? Got a vote, Samuel? I think you could go either way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So there is a little controversy here, though, Samuel. Uh, Mark's gospel ends right here now you gotta admit it's a bit of an odd ending like the the entire book of mark ends with that statement right there yeah however later manuscripts actually have some more stuff tacked on there's like something that's usually referred to as like mark's short ending sometimes you'll see that in your translation there's mark's longer ending sometimes you'll see that in your translation and sometimes you'll see but this is just the end it's it now we're going to go over the additional endings as we continue but just so you have this in your brain you know that it, it exists in the earliest transcripts mark ends right here he just leaves it hanging he they saw the tomb they fled in fear and and that's it you don't get any more from him. Matthew, though. All right. Uh, now, remember, his story is different. This was the angel rolling the stone, sitting on the stone, whatever. Remember, the women only saw an angel sitting on the stone he had removed. They didn't, like, go into the tomb or any of that stuff. And so they were going to the disciples to tell them what the angel had instructed them. But then, on the way, all of a sudden... Boom! Jesus meets them on the way. I, I, what? That's crazy, right? Now, they see him, immediately recognize him. You know, they want to fall at his feet, worship, all that. And as if it's no big deal, Jesus just kind of shouts out, Greetings! <laughs> you know, like, hey, hey, I'm back! I feel like that's the the first century equivalent of waza <laughs> exactly yeah now it appears again like they immediately recognize him they fall at his feet and, and to be clear they are actually grabbing his feet ankles i don't know calves something right they are touching him grabbing him and worshiping him now to be clear because I know we've mentioned things like this before. The worship that we're talking about here is, you know, things that you might normally think of. To bow before someone as an act of allegiance or reference or regard, something like that. This isn't to be confused with worship in the normal biblical sense, which is sacrifice in the temple. And maybe I shouldn't say the normal. Uh, it's the more... It's like the more important sense or something. It's like when we talk about worship in the big story, we have to remember when we're talking about worship, you know, they went to the temple to worship. They did this, they did this. It doesn't look like it does today. They did sacrifice. That was worship. So anyway, this one is the bowing and allegiance, reverence, regard, all that. So anyway, Jesus speaks to them and he starts with, do not be afraid. Well, Samuel... Do you think Jesus appears like one of these angels where he's big and scary and all that? Oh, well, that would compromise him being recognizable then, right? Right, yeah. It, it doesn't appear so. It just He just looks like himself because they immediately know. All right, so he's not saying do not be afraid because he's scary like the angels can be sometimes. But think about it, Samuel. It's because <laughs> he's someone they know someone they just watched die in a horrible excruciating manner they saw him 
entombed. And so do not be afraid. It's something more along the lines of, hey, uh, my brain can't compute what's happening here right now. Kind of a scary. Right. So he's just he's calming them in that sense. Hey, it don't don't be afraid. It's just me. And then he basically repeats the instructions that the angel had already given them. Why was that necessary? I don't know. Maybe they got so excited he knew they needed a refresher. <laughs> I don't know. But one difference, one difference when Jesus sends the message, he says, go and tell my brothers. Hmm. And okay, it's a small difference because obviously the angel probably couldn't or wouldn't say something like that. But I read that and to me that just comes across as so sweet. Jesus is referring to the disciples as my brothers. Even after resurrection, he's now, quote unquote, perfected, you know, all that thing. I, I don't know. I love that. But anyway, mm-hmm. that's that little bit. Got anything, Samuel? Well, yeah, it's just, it's interesting that he uses the phrase my brothers when in rabbinic discipleship relationships in the first century, a rabbi would have been seen almost oh. like a father figure to right. their students. Yeah, um, it's, instead of my sons, it's yeah, my brothers. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know what to make of that. I'm just saying it's interesting because of the cultural context. Yeah, um, well, he's the firstborn of many brethren. Oh, yeah. In the end, in the big story, that is the end result, that we are to be his brethren. We, we share in the inheritance. All of, all of those little phrases, I can't think of them all, obviously, but those all point to, hey, it's a family. There's one father. We all have the same father. We're all brothers, all that. So, uh, yeah, I like it. In fact, I love it. <laughs> uh, the other thing, so we should take this part in Matthew, that, and behold, Jesus met them and said greetings as not natural in terms of like they were walking and then they see someone down the path and then they get closer to this person and then they realize it's Jesus. It's like one moment there's nobody there and then the next moment out of like thin air oh, person oh. is there and it's Jesus. Like yeah. are we supposed to, is the text alluding to it being something that is like bending the rules of space right. and time. Yeah, you know what? I don't know about that, Samuel. I can't. I, yeah, I don't know. That's a really good point. It, 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 I guess it could be either. And they were running, not walking, just saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I, I guess it could be either. It, when it says, and behold, maybe he did just kind of appear. Or yeah. it could be that they were running along and this guy that they see, all of a sudden they get closer and they go, oh my gosh, it's him. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good the, question. The reason I ask is is we're going to get to portions later with Jesus interacting oh, yeah. with his disciples where things are going to get weird like yeah in yeah. terms of physical reality right yeah his new body his resurrected body definitely allows him to do new and crazy remarkable things and theoretically ours will also uh don't know but that's kind of the idea so yeah good point yeah just it, that remains a question I don't know all right moving on uh, we're just going to stick with Matthew now. We're looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. It says this. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. All right. Now, we're getting to some good stuff now, Samuel. So according to Matthew, uh, in, in his case, it's the two Marys, okay? While the two Marys are headed back to town and meeting Jesus on the way, the guard, and at least some of the guard, 
also left the tomb. And they went straight to the chief priests, not to Pilate, (laughs) to the chief priests. And they told them all that had happened. And this is one of those reasons, Samuel, why I kind of feel like they weren't unconscious. Because Mm -hmm. if they told them all that would happen, it would be, so an angel appeared and then we woke up. (laughs) I mean, it's kind of a dumb story, right? So I'm thinking they were still conscious, aware in some sense, just further. But anyway, now remember in Matthew's version, the big scary angel, he had come, rolled away the stone and sat on it while the guard was frozen in fear. And, And remember, many of the ones to whom they're telling the story would be Sadducees, possibly all of them. They don't even believe in angels, resurrection, afterlife, any of that stuff. If there had been any Pharisees there, possibly, possibly not, for whatever it's worth, they would have been more accepting of this part of the story. There would have been something about that. They would have gone, oh, oh, this is good. We, we know about this stuff, right? But Anyway, again, with the guards, either they were unconscious and had very little to tell, or they heard and saw everything while they were kind of, I don't know, frozen, if you will, and had a lot to tell. Who knows? We we can't answer that question. But something we never usually think of is they may have actually had to wait to speak to someone. So here they are. The guards are going through all this crazy thing at the tomb. They run into town. They want to see the chief priest and they get there. And all of a sudden they're just kind of sitting around. You can imagine the elevator music playing in the background, whatever. Why? Because this was the day of the first fruits offering. Okay. In Israel, this would have been barley. It was the first fruits offering. This was the day that marked when Jews in Israel in general, they could begin eating of the spring harvest. It was also the day that they would begin the counting of the Omer, which is seven sevens, 49 days. And then on the 50th day is Pentecost, Shavuot. So think about that, Samuel, just the the connection to the festivals. Jesus was raised on the day of first fruits. He is the firstborn. He is the first fruits of eternal life. All of that. He was the first fruit of salvation. It's just all kind of cool. All this stuff, in some ways, it lines up with all these festivals that Jews and Israel have been celebrating for centuries and centuries. It's just, it's neat. So anyway, uh, the chief priests, so they have to go through all of these ceremonies. They have to do all this stuff, which is why... These these guard, they, they literally could have just been sitting around waiting. Look, we, we really would like to talk to you guys. Could you just finish up your little ceremony so we can tell you what happened? Anyway, they, they get the news from the guard and the chief priests gather the council. And again, we kind of have to wonder, was, was it all of it or just some part of it? And, you know, I'm going to lead toward it's only some part of it because, you know, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. And in the end, what they choose is something that is very ungodlike, something that they're going to lie, they're going to cheat, they're going to, you know, whatever. So in the end, they decide they're going to bribe the soldiers to take the blame. Oh, we fell asleep and the disciples snuck in and stole his body. How do you know you were asleep? (laughs) I mean, you may know the body's gone, but how do you know the disciples did it, right? Anyway, the point is, and this is important, this was an outright lie. Now we see this in the text. We we see that they're creating this as a lie. And people would question, well, how does Matthew know? Whatever. Hold on. There, we're saying it's an outright lie. And notice something, Samuel, this lie has persisted to this day. If you went out, started searching around Google, went on YouTube, whatever it was, and you were looking for, hey, did they steal his body? You would still find people arguing how it was that the disciples had stolen his body. This is still going on. So long time. Now, what's important though, if you look at the rest of scripture and at some point, there's a matter of faith, are the eyewitness accounts real or whatever. 
But we've got a lot of eyewitness accounts. In fact, the scriptures tell us that there were over 500 witnesses to the risen Christ. And and you even you got to think about things. Did, would people would people experience martyrdom? And trust me, the ways that people were killed were awful, awful, awful. We just went through this with Jesus's crucifixion. Are they really going to go through that over a lie? I mean, are these guys, think about all these guys. They're, Samuel, the disciples, what is their basic mode of operation right now? Are they just walking around the city, calm, cool, collected, you know, right out in the open, all that? What are they doing? I mean, they were fleeing. They were hiding. Exactly. So what exactly was it? that changed them from one day they're walking around fearful, hiding, all of this stuff, to the next thing you know, they are bold gospel messengers, afraid of nothing, right? What? Here's the thing. When we read history and we go, oh, well, this happened and this happened and this happened, we don't question it at all. We've got as much proof for all the things that we're reading in the Bible as most all other history does but we accept history, but when it comes to the Bible, all of a sudden everything is suspect. Hmm. So anyway, I'm kind of on a soapbox there. Let's get back to the council. They promised the guard that they would make sure that Pilate did not punish them if he heard, you know, about this lie. And that's another reason why it seems obvious that the guard was actually Roman. It was provided by Pilate. Just kind of putting these little pieces together. So Anyway, Matthew, he's super explicit. He says that they took the bribe and that they did exactly as they were told. Now, Matthew adds that the lie was still going strong even at the time Matthew wrote his gospel. And so that's going to be, we're going to go with the dating that's sometime in the 60s AD. There, Other people think it was later, whatever. We're going with that one. Matthew probably thought that it was pretty amazing that the lie had such a long life. <laughs> but as we just noted, it's still going today. He had no idea, I'm sure, how powerful this lie was going to be. But there you go. What you got there, Samuel? Liar, liars. <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of Matthew being a gospel account writer, how within this particular section of him describing these guards going to the chief priest and outlining this outlining this conversation, how do we inference how he got that information in terms of being able to then take it to include it within his gospel narrative? It would it have been something that he would have gotten through word of mouth of the, these guards after they got out of that conversation. I'm just, I'm kind of grappling with how yeah. a disciple would have gotten this information. Right. Yeah. And what you're asking, this is a very common uh, critique of the gospels. They're talking about things they never could have seen or witnessed or known or whatever. So, the, the simple answer is, oh, we have no idea how he got this information. But if you were looking for where would be the likely source, I think if it were me, I would be looking to the Sanhedrin. I would be looking to, remember, there are, there are disciples of Jesus in the Sanhedrin. Were they at this meeting? Eh, maybe, maybe not. I would actually lean toward probably not. However, because of their position, because of their relationships, etc., they may have actually been able to get some of this info, you know, from from the people who were there, and then maybe Matthew somehow got it from them. But gotcha. In the end, the answer is uh, we have no idea. Gotcha. Anything else? Nope. I mean, I, I I didn't bring that up to say that like, oh, it's a problem for me. It's it's causing me oh, to no, no, no. distrust the. No, no, the yeah. credibility of the scriptures, but I think it's a valid question to ask because, you know, it, like you said, it gets brought up in other people's conversations, critiques, criticisms of the scripture, and being able to have a an honest response is important. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. So many Christians, they just stick their head in the sand. Somebody brings up a problem with the Bible and they just go, oh, inspired word of God, inerrant. You know, I mean, they, <laughs> they don't know what to say. They have nothing. And, and they're afraid that if they actually engage in any way, logically, reasonably, whatever, that, that, that they're going to be in trouble. Something's going to go wrong. So we can't do that. You got to just just acknowledge, hey, I, I don't know where you got that information. Seems impossible, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. So yeah, good, good, good. Well, where are we heading here? So we're going to do a couple things. We're going to now move on to some of, this is where Mark's short ending would appear or Mark's longer ending would appear. And so uh, either at this point you would see all of the shorter ending or you would see the longer ending. It's like Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. And at this point, we're not even going to bother reading it. I, I don't know that it's actually helping us in our goal here of telling the story. So uh, we also are looking at Luke chapter 24, verses 9 through 11, and John chapter 20, verse 2. And so... You know, again, I think I'm just going to read both of those. Uh, Let's start with Luke. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them now john (laughs) he takes us on quite a different track uh and so again we're just going to go with it we it is what it is john chapter 20 verse 2 so she ran and went to simon peter and the other disciple the one whom jesus loved and said to them they have taken the lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. All right, probably wondering why I even have these two grouped together, and it's, you know, it's just the difficulty in trying to keep the sequence going, so we'll we'll just try and talk through it all. So in this part, uh, we've already talked about Mark actually ends at verse 8, and now these are the alternate endings. Say it again, the oldest manuscripts don't have anything after verse 8. But some have this short ending. Most have the long ending. But most scholars think both endings were later additions. We've even got scribal marks in the original, or in the manuscripts that are basically marking these things as, hey, I don't think these are real. I think these got added. So it isn't just us thinking it. It's people all along the way. Anyway, we've included them. Uh, But we're going to give preference to the other texts uh, when available. So, you know, you'll see how we we work with that. But let's start with John this time. Remember, in John's story, John only has Mary Magdalene in in the picture right at this point. And for what it's worth, Mark, he has a little something that reminds us that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. (laughs) Nice thing to be remembered for. But anyway... Uh, remember, uh, Mary, it was dark, and she saw that the guards were gone, and the stone rolled away, and that's it. And so that's kind of weird, because we've got other stories where it was only some of the guard that left, and, uh, you know, it seems like it's maybe not dark anymore, whatever. So confusion or contradiction, whatever you want to call it, between the gospel stories, but that's what she saw. Guards are gone, stones rolled away, it's mostly dark. And so she runs back to Peter and John and tells them they have taken Jesus' body. First question, Samuel, who is they? Is she talking about the guards or... (laughs) Right. We we don't know, but because in, in John's story, the guards are gone you might be thinking that it's the guards that have taken his body. Now, we don't really know, but in context, that kind of seems to be what she thinks happened. And she adds that she doesn't know where they've taken him. But 
here's another question. Doesn't say anything about her looking in the tomb, going in the tomb, any of that kind of stuff. She just sees that it's open. How did she know he was gone? I mean, do we just assume, hey, she took a peek or <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's kind of weird that there's nothing explicit about that. But then additionally, listen to this, Samuel. It says they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Well, who's we? In the story, she's the only one there. Did she maybe she was leaving and all of a sudden some of the other women showed up and so she was going with them? Or I mean, it's just odd. And to me, it's odd because John, he's such a a sneaky, incredible kind of writer. This doesn't feel sneaky and incredible. It just feels kind of like uncareful or something. I don't know. But anyway, and so in John's story, that's the way it looks. The problem is Luke, well, he gives us a little more, but it's very different. Uh, remember, we're talking about a bunch of women at this point. Luke, uh, he tries to name some, but he never names them all. So there's a bunch of women. The women report all that they saw to who? The 11 apostles. Now, if we had read some from Mark, you would see that it turns out that Mark agrees with that part of his story. So Mark kind of agrees with both, if you can imagine that. So they, they tell their story to the 11 apostles and to everyone else. That was that. Well, who's that? We don't even know. Now, remember in this version, there were angels in the tomb explaining things. They had to go in the tomb. They saw the angels. The angels explained things. They remind them of Jesus's words. And then they remember all of that. So Luke gives some more info on you know, who was actually telling the story? Who were, who were the people relaying the facts? And it's a list. We've seen some of these before. We've got Mary Magdalene. She's like a constant in all these stories. Now, Luke mentions uh, a woman named Joanna. And he also mentions another Mary. And this is that same confusion. Some scholars are going to argue, hey, this is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And others are going to argue, no, it's a different Mary. She's just the mother of little Jim you know, James the Lesser, whatever. Again, we're not going to solve that. Just go with it. We're not certain who everybody is. But it wasn't just those three. There were also other women. And, you know, I don't know. What's one of those words? I think it sounds like a whole gaggle of women. Samuel, what do you think of that? First time I've heard that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably completely inappropriate, but whatever. We're just playing. So uh, now you got to imagine these women, these women... <laughs> <laughs> they were probably pretty excited. I mean, this was pretty great news. However, no one believed them. They thought it just sounded like a tale that you would invent when you were just sitting around and you had too much time on your hands, right? But a couple of them, Something in them, they have that thought. Maybe maybe they actually remember some of Jesus' words. And and you're, we're going to see where the story goes. But at least a couple of the guys sitting there listening to the story started to think in their heads, what if? And so we'll address that in the next section. But you got anything before we go there? Yeah, I mean, it's probably another great opportunity for most people to harp once again on the disciples lack of faith for them not believing the these women their right. uh, account their testimony but you just have to think I mean people express grief and the mourning of loss in different ways and you know it could have been that they thought that these women were expressing this grief in this way to help be able to cope with the loss of their rabbi and teacher. And that right. was maybe one of the reasons why they didn't believe them. So, I mean, it's, it's still, it doesn't help the problem because of how much Jesus seemed to prioritize the role of women within his, you know, circle of people that he was teaching and bringing with him as he was moving from, village to village um within israel but yeah. it, so it because of that you would think that his disciples would give them more credence to the the authority of their word so i'm just 
just putting it out there that it's not as black and white as most people paint this situation. There's probably much more complex things going on within their minds at hearts to cause them to, you know, dismiss it uh, that they said that the tomb was empty. Yeah. Actually, you know, what it reminds me of is this whole idea of confirmation bias. Now, we might think of that, but when we're talking about Bible, Scripture, you know, teaching, interpretation, all that stuff, when we think of that using confirmation bias, it's basically this idea. I'm reading the text, but I'm seeing what I want to see. I already have a story in my head, and so while I'm reading, whatever the text may say, what I see is that it's just confirming what I already know. Well, in a sense... That's what's happening to all of these people involved in this story. They have an idea of what they think is supposed to happen, what God's going to do, how salvation is going to work, all of this stuff. It's not working out the way they thought it should be in their head. And so all along the way, even though Jesus has been very explicit about so many things, has given them every reason to, to, to know what's coming, to see it happen, to, to believe, they still keep defaulting back to, apparently, what they thought the story ought to be. And it causes them to be confused, have unbelief, whatever, all this stuff. So it's a big warning to us. When we read our scriptures, don't read it so that it will confirm what you think you already know. Read it for what's there. Try to see what it's actually saying instead of what you think it says it's Mm. just it's an important lesson so for sure sorry anything else in that section no all right well let's keep going we're going to look at let's see mark chapter 16 verses 12 and 13 luke chapter 14 verse 12 and now we're going heavy on john this is john chapter 20 verses 3 through 10 and we're just going to read john's story So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Okay. Some really cool stuff and also uh, little bits that make you have questions. So just to cover it, we didn't read it, but Mark tells us that Jesus appeared in another form to two of them, two, two apostles. We don't even know which two. He appears in another form as they walked in the country. Now, this could be a separate issue. This could actually relate to the Emmaus walk story that's coming up, different things like that. But Jesus is appearing to two of the disciples or the apostles in Mark's version. A little bit odd compared to the other stories. And then they went back to tell the others, and no one believed them either. And just to cover this, Luke tells us that Peter went to the tomb by himself, saw Jesus was gone, and went home marveling at what had happened. So, again, you see, I told you we're going to have a lot of discrepancy in these eyewitness accounts, but we're going to go back to John. Now, John gives us a lot of really good detail, a lot of stuff to talk about, so let's, let's go focus on that now. So Peter and John run to the tomb. Now, if you remember... John is the one telling the story. And so, in all humility, John tells us that he outran Peter. And he reached the tomb 
first. And I, for the life of me, cannot figure out why this is an important detail for John to include, except that he wanted to bust Peter's chops. That's yeah, all they, I've... They must have been rivals in some way within <laughs> the group of yeah. disciples. He must have been. But anyway, John peeks in and he sees the linen cloths and no body. But he didn't go in. And I'm going to emphasize this stuff because John wrote it this way. Then Peter came following him. John's emphasizing, hey, I totally beat Peter to the tomb, right? (laughs) But Peter gets there and Peter, he doesn't wait. He goes right in, right into the tomb. Now, we're going to pick on John teasing Peter a lot. However, to be fair, it could be that right in this moment, that John waited for Peter as an act of deference. He knew that Peter was kind of like the leader among the group. And so even though he beat him to the tomb, he waited and let Peter go in first. Maybe, don't know. But Peter gets inside and he sees two things. Number one, it's the linen cloth that Jesus's body was wrapped in. Now remember, it was originally tied at the wrists and the ankles. Number two, he saw the separate cloth that was around Jesus's head. We spoke of that before. We said that it was it was put around his head, and I don't know if it said it was tied. It said something about having seven windings. I don't really know what that looks like. Couldn't find any good imagery to help me with that. But the point is, whatever this thing was around his head, it was folded up and kept separate. So, Simple question, Samuel. If someone had taken the body, why would they undress it first? Mm -hmm. Seems like something a serial killer would do. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be easier to carry him if he was all bound up in a cloth? However, do you remember what was in the cloth with him? Mm. Did Did they layer the cloth with all those spices? Yeah. 75 pounds of spices. So, if you were looking for a reason that someone might undress the body before taking it, well, that's one. So, I don't know that. I mean, of course, we assume that he was risen, kind of like he just floated out of the cloth or whatever. But I'm just saying, for the people who are trying to figure out how he could have been stolen, well, that at least makes some sense. However, there's the other side of it. If Jesus had, in fact, risen, I mean, there's kind of the question of, you know, why leave the cloths? And and and, and that I mentioned it before, the cloths that were laying on or inside the tomb, were the knots still in them? It doesn't really say. And whatever it was they're viewing, it had to be confusing from every perspective. I, I want to. So, Samuel, remember when Lazarus was raised? Mm -hmm. When he walked out of the tomb, what was he covered with? With those same burial linen cloths. Yeah, yeah. He still had his cloths on. He was, you know, let's use the word resuscitated. It was more than three days. But when he came out of the tomb, he still had all the cloths on. But when Jesus is resurrected, all the cloths are left in the tomb. Now, we don't know this. I mean, it could have been that, oh, he woke up from death and he just sort of unwrapped himself or whatever and just left everything on the table. Sure. But a lot of scholars believe that what they're trying to do is give us the imagery that the cloths were just laying there as if the body was still in them, laying in the right spot, all tied up in the right places. However, his body was no longer there. It doesn't say that. It's people, you know, trying to put this together, thinking the text might be suggesting that, whatever. I'm just saying it's kind of weird. But all of this is just to maybe emphasize the difference between resuscitation, like we saw in the Lazarus story, and resurrection in this story. There's just a difference. Claws are left behind as opposed to Jesus wearing them when he comes out. But anyway, you may be swayed by that or not. Doesn't matter. Just kind of throwing that out there. But John, who had reached the tomb first, it says again, also went in. 
he saw and believed. And it even tells us up to this point, they still just didn't get it. The scriptures, okay, and in hindsight, the scriptures were clear that he must rise from the dead. And everything that Jesus had told them was clear that he should rise from the dead. But till now, they just couldn't see that. But John, in this moment, believes. At least that's what John tells us. (laughs) And then John adds one more little bit. The disciples went to their homes. And then, I mean, again, because the story's jumping around the way it is, are we talking about Peter and John? Because why wouldn't they just say they or Peter and John? It says the disciples. Or maybe they meant all the disciples. They all went back to their home. Well, are they saying their homes back in Jerusalem, as in where they were staying, or their homes back in Galilee and around there? But we don't know. But as we continue, the story seems to remain in and around Jerusalem for a bit. So, I mean, they're definitely going to go back to Galilee, but when they go, remains just a little bit gray. So just pointing that out, because as you're reading, it's going to feel like, wait a second, where are we? Who's doing what? Where? It's just, it's a little hard to follow. But anyway, anything on that section, Samuel? Yeah, um, a couple weeks ago when we were in the section where Joseph and Nicodemus were preparing Jesus' body and placing these cloths over his his corpse, um, there was something that I had deferred talking about until a later point in the story, which is right now. Yay! Um, <laughs> and that is, and I hope this doesn't open a whole can of worms or get us distracted, but I'm sure, Paul, you have probably heard of the Shroud of Turin before. Oh, yeah. And what do we make of that? Do we, at least with within okie dokie most, do we give that any sort of credibility or is it just another visual tool to help us give us a picture of what burial cloths would have looked like and especially if those aloes and spices would have left an imprint on the body that's what it could have looked like but not taking it as literally as the Catholic Church takes it as it is Jesus' burial cloth well Samuel this is a tough moment because I'm one of those kind of guys that I'm not really impressed or concerned with a lot of these findings because so much has been destroyed by different peoples and cultures and everything in the land and all that kind of stuff. Okay, let me just say it this way. Is the Shroud of Turin real or not real? I have no idea. The sad part is, I'm going to be honest, I don't really care. I just, I just don't care about it. So I I say that because that also means I just don't know a lot about it. I mean, when they say Shroud of Turin, are they talking about just the little piece that went around his head? Are they talking about the piece that went around his body? Are they talking about both? Is it two separate pieces? Is it one large piece? I don't even know the answers to those kind of questions. I do know the part about it supposedly has the imprint of his face. Mm -hmm. Well, if it isn't just the little head cloth with seven windings, okay, already I'm skeptical and like not convinced in any way. But in the end, I don't have any trouble believing all of this without the Shroud of Turin. And with the Shroud of Turin, I feel like well, the only people that's going to convince are people that don't already believe. And again, that's not me. So I don't really know what to do with that. I'm going to turn it around. Samuel, tell us something about this Shroud of Turin and what you think about it. Uh, if your questions bring up a really good point in that if you Google it and you know, there's all kinds of photographs of it, this article of of linen of interest is a single length of cloth so if we're going off of what the gospel accounts are 
seeming to indicate with there being separate cloths for the torso portion of the body and one for his face, then that already gets weird uh, in terms of right. matching that up. I, you know, I personally, I don't really have an opinion. I'm, I, I'm like you. I'm leaning more towards it not being cr- as historically credible. I think they've done radiocarbon like a dating of the cloth, and I think within like a ninety-five percent confidence level, they've dated it to the medieval times, like within th- like it being made in the thirteen hundreds. Um, but mm. regardless, I know that the Catholic Church has done like three-dimensional image scanning where they have been able to like give a I guess a hypothesized prediction of what the body would have looked like based on if there were open wounds where blood or bodily fluids would have seeped through on the cloth and like there are displays in this one particular Catholic church that's got like a research division that it does do a good job of showcasing what the after effects of a tortured, a scourged, a cruci- crucified body would have looked like go- going into burial. Like you can look that stuff up, and I think that that imagery will help your, you know, piecing together all this stuff as we move along. But I, like I'm like you, yeah. I don't think we should take it maybe as hyper literally as the Catholic Church is. Yeah. The the whole is it one piece, two piece, all that, that I mean that that would be a big, big important piece of information for me. But yeah, I think honestly, for the people that see this cloth and and it does something in them, like it, it moves them in some way that's that that how do I say it, pushes them to belief. Well, I'm all for it. I mean, it sounds kind of weird. I don't care how you get there. The fact that it's pushing you to belief, I think, is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm also, though, the guy that's super in favor of, yeah, and once you believe, you've got a whole lifetime of work ahead of you trying to see and know and understand him better and your relation to him better. And so it can't stop there. Hey, if if people are moved to belief because of it, I am a fan. And if they're not, it doesn't matter. You know, just in the end, you need to be convinced by God, and his story, the mm-hmm. actual, the, that part of it, rather than, you know, little artifacts that we might find. Although, right. you know, it is kind of neat when you get some mm-hmm. evidence that backs up your story or whatever. I don't know. Anything else in this part, Samuel? No. All right. Well, this next section is really kind of a big one. Certainly not going to fit in just the last few minutes that we have here. So I think people are going to get lucky and walk away with a slightly short episode. (laughs) (laughs) Enjoy your few minutes, folks. That's right. Don't say we never gave you anything. All right. Let's get out of here. Okie dokie. Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And be sure to leave us a five-star rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.